Okay. Okay. Thanks for allowing us to do this. Oh, thank you for doing it. Doesn't happen very often. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. an air of expectation, I think. Good afternoon on this beautiful day. It's my privilege to welcome you to our colloquium today, The Word Set Free, which is sponsored by the Center for Christian Jewish Learning here at Boston College. My name is James Bernauer, and along with Rabbi Ruth Langer and Sister Audrey Detzel, we direct the center. The center was established right at the beginning of the new millennium. And I like to think that it shares the confidence of being present at the birth of a new historical epoch. That as far as Jewish Christian relations are concerned, one page has been decisively turned and we're busy writing a new and far more promising chapter in the relationship between these two faith communities. The center's activities aim to contribute to that ongoing reconciliation. And there are many of them. We sponsor lectures and conferences, assorted courses, visiting scholars, an online journal, a Jewish Christian dialogue for faculty, and certainly we will always be invested in scholarly scrutiny of anti-Semitism. We also want to serve the mission of the School of Theology and Ministry in whatever ways we can. And so we look forward to an ongoing collaboration with this school, its faculty and students in the years ahead. Today, we are to learn from and celebrate the work of Father Daniel Harrington of the Society of Jesus. Father Harrington is, of course, a distinguished scripture scholar, but as he knows far better than most of us, the study of scripture itself has sometimes been used to support, as he puts it in a recent book review, the noxious power of Christian theological anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism, I should say. Father Harrington has been a Jesuit for over 50 years, and he is a representative of a significant development in the relationship between the Jewish people and the society of Jesus. That relationship has had a very complex and often difficult history, but, a, but an important new stage in it was inaugurated during the last century. Perhaps the two most distinguished, outstanding moments in this new beginning were the aid that some Jesuits offered to Jewish people during the Shoah assistance that has been generously recognized by the State of Israel. And then there is the special witness of Jesuit scholars in a renewed Christian appreciation of the Jewish scriptures. One recalls particularly the labors of the late Jesuit Cardinal Bea at the Vatican Council and his indispensable contribution to the drafting and adoption of Nostra Aetate. At this point, I would like to introduce Dr. Audrey Detzel, who is a sister of Zion and the associate director of our center. She has been a leader in interfaith relations for many years and has superbly organized this colloquium as she has so many of the activities of the center during the last three years. She will introduce today's program and our speakers. Audrey. Thanks very much, Father Bernauer. In the interest of allowing as much time as possible for the colloqui colloquium itself, I'm going to keep my introductory remarks as brief as possible. Uh, this will be rather easy to do because any attempt to introduce Father Dan Harrington, especially here at Boston College, would be quite redundant. Um, <clears throat> Everybody here knows this greatly appreciated and much sought after professor and scripture scholar. 
and this greatly respected Jesuit and friend. Excuse me. <coughs> this is cold season, so you'll have to bear with this for a bit. But let me just say a few words about why we, the Center for Christian Jewish Learning, chose today to thank and to pay tribute to Dan Harrington. Jim has already spoken to this, but I'd like for us to go back for a moment to the Second Vatican, Vatican Council, especially to paragraph four in the 1965 Declaration on the Relationship of the Church to Non-Christian Religions, the document best known as Nostra Aetate. In Nostra Aetate, we hear, and I quote, since the spiritual patrimony common to Christians and Jews is thus so great, the sacred synod wishes to foster and recommend that mutual understanding and respect, which is the fruit above all of biblical and theological studies and of brotherly dialogue. Vatican documents in 1974 and 1985, which we refer to as the guidelines and the notes, these two documents further expanded this call from the council. They state more specifically such things as, and again I quote, research into the problems bearing on Judaism and Jewish, Jewish Christian relations will be encouraged among specialists, particularly in the fields of exegesis, theology, history, and sociology. Or as the notes state, and I quote, all of this should help us understand that the church and Christianity find their origin in the Jewish milieu of the first century of our era. And more deeply still, in the design of God realized in the patriarchs, Moses, the prophets, and Jesus. Over the past four decades, this Jesuit scholar has responded to this call from, to, from the church in an exceptional manner. All we need to do is to look at the list of his published works. And don't worry, <laughs> I'm not going to list them all. <laughs> or <laughs> we spend the rest of the time of the symposium listing Dan's publications. Dan has been an exceptional figure locally, nationally, and internationally in the Christian Jewish biblical and theological studies. And he has been engaged second to none in brotherly dialogues. And I think he would say also in sisterly dialogues. <laughs> the members of our, on our panel here today are an eloquent, eloquent uh, testimony to this. Never before in organizing a conference or a panel and I've organized quite a few in my lifetime, but never have I found it so easy to put together a panel, even though two had to cancel out. <laughs> it was still easy to fill the, fill the slots. I did not have to twist an arm, and I didn't even have to promise an exorbitant honorarium. <laughs> when I asked, their responses were immediate and more than enthusiastic. I heard, yes, of course. For Dan, absolutely. Those responses speak for themselves. And I won't steal the panelists' thunder by going into greater detail about why they responded, that why they so spontaneously accepted. I'll let them speak for themselves. Unfortunately, one of our panelists, Dr. Eugene Fisher, is unable to be with us here today. Uh, due to his daughter, who is very sick and in the hospital. Gene felt that as a daddy, his first duty was to be with his daughter, and we agreed with him. Gene is now retired, but since 1977, he was Associate Director for Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs with the American Conference of Catholic Bishops. If Gene were here, he would have helped us see in so many ways Dan Harrington's influence on church leaders and their efforts in Christian Jewish relations both nationally and internationally. But we do have three fine panelists here today, 
and they will be speaking from their own background, context, and experience. And you will find how each, in their own way, have benefited from and greatly appreciate uh, Don's contribu uh, Dan's contributions. Father David Michael is a local boy. For eight years, from 1997 until 2005, David was Catholic chaplain at Brandeis University. He is now pastor at St. John Chrysostom Parish in West Roxbury. As if this weren't enough to keep him busy, he also works in the Archdiocesan Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs Office, uh, where he is associate director for interreligious relations. In this capacity, Father David has a strong focus on Christian Jewish relations. Uh, Dr. Christopher Layton, whom we welcome here today from Baltimore, where he is executive director of the Institute for Christian and Jewish Studies. Chris has been executive director since the Insti Institute's inception in 1987. But I will let Chris tell you more about this himself. He is a graduate of the Princeton Theological Seminary and Columbia University. He's also a Presbyterian minister. And his presence here today also bears witness to what has been happening and is continuing to happen as together we probe, together as Christians, we probe the meaning and richness of our roots in Judaism. And as together we work to clear anti-Judaism and supersessionism from our theology and liturgy. And as together we seek what lessons we as Christians need to learn from the tragic failure of Christianity during the Holocaust. <clears throat> Our third panelist is Celia Serwa, and Celia is a local girl. And she had the courage and generosity yesterday afternoon when Jean had to cancel out. She very generously said, yes, of course, I'll be part of this colloquium panel. Celia, thank you so much for helping us out in on such short-term notice. <clears throat> Celia teaches scripture in the Archdiocesan Master of Arts and Ministry program. What is of particular interest and importance for us here today is that 25 years ago, she helped co-found what is known as the New Directions program, a program co-sponsored by the Archdiocese and ADL, the Anti-Defamation League here in Boston. New Directions is a program for Catholic and Jewish educators aimed at helping Catholic and Jewish teachers understand and appreciate each other's traditions so that they don't promote further misunderstanding through their teaching. For 25 years, Celia has co-taught this program with a Jewish partner, Naomi Tovim. Um, Naomi is here with us today. Welcome, Naomi. She is an education consultant for the Bureau of Jewish Education. But be not enough by way of introduction, just a few logistic details. Immediately after this colloquium, there will be a reception right outside this room. And we invite you to um, meet each other, to continue our colloquium conversation over snacks and refreshments. The Paulist uh, Press, as you probably noticed, have some of their books on display, and this book display will remain up throughout the, uh, throughout the reception. We are also aware that we may have run out of of Father Harrington's autographed books. We had hoped to have enough on hand, and we promised to have one for each of you. We will, we want to remain true to our promise. And um, if you did not receive a book, there are sheets where we would ask you to sign your name with your email address and telephone number, and we will get, get those books to you. So I am pleased and honored now to call on Father Dan Harrington to speak to us on the word set free, presenting the New Testament in its first century context.
Thank you, Audrey, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for all being here. I see so many familiar faces, and it's uh, a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. What I'd like to do is to give a sense of the approach that one finds in the book. And the outline will give you a sense of what I want to do. Uh, first, I want to reflect briefly on what's the problem. Secondly, what's my response? Uh, then state my thesis. And then if you look over the other side of the handout, uh, what I want to do is to exemplify the methodology that I'm uh, trying to present in the book many, many times over. And then I'd like to uh, conclude with some remarks on my own and why I think this is important and why I've enjoyed doing this kind of work. So uh, first, the problem. Remember Mel Gibson's The Passion of Christ? It seems like years and years ago. And of course, that was a very controversial time, particularly for Christian-Jewish relations. There were all sorts of questions raised. Uh, is Mel Gibson anti-Semitic? Is the film anti-Semitic? And much more importantly, are the Gospels anti-Semitic or anti Jewish? That's an important question, I think. The third question, are the Gospels anti-Jewish? My response to that has always been, uh, in themselves, the Gospels are not anti-Jewish, but certain Gospel texts lend themselves and have fostered anti-Judaism. And so one can say that they have anti-Jewish potential. Let me uh, expand on those two points. The first point, at least I believe, the Gospels themselves are not anti-Jewish. I regard, in fact, the Gospels as Jewish books in the sense that their authors were Jews by birth, one can argue with this, that uh, the main characters were first century Jews, that their narratives are set in the land of Israel, and that they are unintelligible, apart from what we Christians now call the Old Testament and first century Judaism serve as their foundations. So I think in themselves, by means of the author, the narratives, the stories they tell, uh, and the sort of cultural components that uh, in themselves at least I regard the Gospels as Jewish books and indeed part of Second Temple Judaism. However, I also recognize the anti-Jewish potential of at least certain Gospel texts. The most famous of these, of course, or infamous really, comes in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, verse 25, where you have the crowd and, uh, saying, His blood be upon us and on our children. Some people have uh, taken that throughout history as a warrant for uh, anti-Judaism and, even worse, violence against Jews. I suspect everyone here has examples of at least ways in which the anti-Jewish potential of some gospel text has been uh, actualized. Um, let me just give a few examples and then get on to the more positive and uh, constructive elements that I want to speak about. Many, many years ago, uh, I was introduced to a book by Rodney Stark and Charles Gluck. The thesis of the book was that there is a lot of anti-Judaism in the United States and the main agents of it are Christian preachers and teachers. That's a pretty sobering conclusion. This is done 30 or 40 years ago. But it was a serious sociological study, not simply a, an essay. And I think it makes the point that people who are, like ourselves, religious educators and preachers, uh, have at least the potential of being agents of anti-Judaism. A second point, uh, I preach every Sunday in two churches. Uh, I always try to be positive and uh, constructive, 
as a result, I don't get much uh, negative criticism. I'm not particularly controversial. The one time I do is when we come up in Romans 9 through 11. And uh, there's always people well-educated, very serious uh, Roman Catholics who object to what I say about uh, the eternal covenant and things of that nature, or God's uh, promise that all Israel will be saved. Uh, so I've experienced myself that this can be a controversial topic. The third point, you're all familiar with Pat Robertson's famous interpretation of the earthquake in Haiti, that it was because the Haitian people had made a pact with the devil. Um, Pat always seems to find a way to get himself in the headlines to remind us that he's still around. Uh, and I think that's what he did. But for me, uh, more uh, striking was uh, about 10 days ago, I heard a radio show in which uh, the uh, producer of the thing was sort of summarizing reactions to Pat's comments. Obviously, the uh, producer of it was not happy with Pat, and he wanted to show what a fool Pat was. And you had reactions basically from good Christian people. And it was interesting, two comments. One uh, person said, Pat's a Pharisee. Interesting. Uh, another comment was that uh, Pat's God is the God of the Old Testament, as opposed to the God of love of the New Testament. Uh, it, it is um, amazing how much this stuff is ingrained in the Christian psyche. And so uh, I think we do have a problem. If you look at the outline, I have a uh, brief quotation from Nostra Aetate that Audrey introduced before. And it says, consequently, all must take care, lest in catechizing or in preaching the word of God, they teach anything which is not in accord with the truth of the gospel message and of the spirit of Christ. So this uh, statement then uh, puts a special emphasis on preachers and teachers, not to be agents of anti-Semitism as the Stark book uh, said so many years ago, and to be careful and be sensitive to at least the potential for anti-Judaism in some of our texts. So what's my response? Uh, uh, this book, which many of you have and all will have when we get enough copies, um, basically is intended for preachers and teachers. And uh, what it tries to do is to place the um, important gospel texts, particularly the synoptic gospels, in the context of first century Judaism. My uh, approach is positive and constructive, uh, and I want to deal especially with those gospel texts that have been most troublesome for people who want to be sensitive to this whole issue. My thesis is that one effective way to free the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, from their anti-Jewish potential is to read them in their first century Jewish context. The paradox is one often met in historical studies. That is, historical research often has the effect of liberating us from the imagined past. My hope is that Christians and Jews uh, may recognize in these gospel text, how much common ground there is between them, and to discover new and constructive ways of walking together into a new and better future. That's the hope and that's the aim of the project. The volume itself presents uh, introductions to each of the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Then it offers uh, um, essays on 15 passages in each of the three Gospels, so 45 texts all told. And what I've um, tried to do is to correlate those texts with the, the Sunday lectionary, uh, and particularly chose texts that are important, and also in some sense at least problematic for Christian-Jewish relations. 
As I said, the book is intended primarily for Christian preachers and religious educators. I would be happy if it were used in study groups. There are uh, questions for reflection and discussion at the end of each essay. And also, I would be particularly happy if it were used by Christians and Jews together. Experience has shown that the greatest progress made in Christian-Jewish relations happens when people study their common texts. In other words, when Jews and Christians gather together and study Jewish texts and Christian texts. That's where good things seem to happen. In dealing with the Synoptic Gospels, I'm guided by the uh, approach outlined in Vatican II's Dei Verbum, according to which the Gospels are a product of a long and somewhat complex tradition that would include the level of Jesus, the level of the early church, and the level of the evangelists. My focus is obviously especially on the evangelists themselves, in other words, what they wrote and what they put in their Gospels. My volume is a companion to George Smeager's book, The Gospel of John Set Free. In other words, these were originally intended as twins, and that's what they are. Uh, George uh, Smeager does an excellent job of uh, 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 dealing with uh, controversial passages in St. John's Gospel. He also supplies a lot of church documentation about relationships between Christians and Jews. I didn't do all that much of that because it's all in George's book. So, uh, my modest thesis, if you look at your outline, is one effective way to free the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, from their anti-Jewish potential is to read them in their first century Jewish historical context. I emphasize the adjective modest. Obviously, the relationship between Christians and Jews through the centuries and today also is very complicated and has many facets. This is one uh, facet, I think, that we need to take seriously, especially as religious educators and preachers. But it's obviously not the only one. To give you uh, a sense of the kind of things that I'm trying to do in the book, uh, I chose one text, and it's on your outline. Uh, it's from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 16 through 30. This, I think, is uh, uh, timely because last Sunday, the first part of this was the Gospel reading. Next Sunday is the second part. And I think it illustrates some of the uh, problems and opportunities that this approach can give. Uh, so let me just uh, take a look at the first part of this, what we heard last week. Uh, so Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through uh, 21. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom, he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, if you look at the um, um, beginning of the reading, you'll see that parallel texts can be found in Matthew chapter 13 and in Mark chapter 6. In fact, if you look at those, you'll find that what Luke has done is he's taken Mark's text, presumably, only six verses, and he's expanded it enormously, and he's placed it at the beginning of Jesus' public activity. And the result is this can be called Luke's programmatic preface to Jesus' public activity. 
And he's obviously uh, using it as a vehicle to say what he regards presumably as an important uh, bunch of things to say about the person of Jesus. In fact, many of the great themes Luke develops are found precisely in this text. Now, what I'm interested in is possibilities and problems. Possibilities. This is an important text for um, Jewish liturgy. Whether Luke had first-hand knowledge of Jewish liturgy or, or whatever, uh, somehow or other he learned enough about it to say things that serve, in fact, in uh, the study of Jewish liturgy as pegs uh, on which to place a lot of stuff that you have evidence for only at a much later time. And so uh, what I'm asking you to do is to imagine the scene as Luke might have wanted us to imagine it. Uh, Jesus comes to the synagogue. Uh, archaeologists haven't discovered a synagogue yet in Nazareth, although they have discovered some interesting things fairly recently. Uh, whether the synagogue was a kind of building by itself or simply a public space where people came together. At any rate, uh, Jesus comes to the Sabbath service as he shows his obedience to the Jewish tradition, an emphasis already in the infancy narratives. Uh, he stands up to read the scroll, uh, think of the pictures you've seen of the Dead Sea Scrolls, in other words, not a book, but a scroll. The scroll is open to him, it's unrolled, and he goes to Isaiah chapter 61 with a kind of tag on Isaiah chapter 58. Now, this uh, scripture reading has uh, many of the great themes that are going to be developed in the body of the narrative. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Luke presents Jesus as the sort of focus of the energy of the Holy Spirit throughout his gospel. Because he has anointed me, he is the Messiah, according to Luke and other early Christians. The one who brings good news to the poor. Luke is especially concerned with Jesus' special interest in marginal persons. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. Uh, this is a kind of gospel of liberation. And uh, the healing activity then is, uh, is, is as it were, uh, anticipated in this scripture text. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Some people argue that this is um, a reference to the jubilee year. Perhaps it is, perhaps it isn't, but at least it has that, that overtone to it. So, this uh, scripture text then, Luke presents as the key to understanding the person of Jesus and his activities. Then, after the scripture uh, text has been read, he rolls up the scroll, gives it to the attendant, the hazan, uh, the um, uh, sexton, if you will, and he sits down and then gives the world's shortest sermon. We should all imitate his example. <laughs> Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Today is a very important word all through Luke's gospel, and it appears here right at the beginning. The issue here, and this is perhaps the problem, is what, we, what do we mean by fulfillment? Is fulfillment... Uh, 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 to be understood as we don't need it anymore? I don't think so. But uh, So you see here many uh, possibilities of helping both Jews and Christians to appreciate the Jewishness of Jesus. And at the same time, at the end here, you run into a big, fat theological roadblock, uh, at least one that becomes controversial. Let's take a look at the... Uh, second part of this, and this would be um, what will be read in many Christian churches, certainly all Catholic churches and many Protestant churches this Sunday. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, doubtless you will uh, quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. 
and you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there, are, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heavens were uh, shut up three years and six months and there was a severe famine all over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephtha in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage, and they got up and drove him out of the town and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. More problems here, perhaps, than possibilities, but some of both. Okay, first he gets a mixed reception uh, in the synagogue. People initially are interested in what he has to say. In fact, they're surprised that this hometown boy suddenly gets such wisdom. I'm always um, reminded of an incident that I experienced about 20 years ago when one of my high school classmates was on the David Brinkley show with Sam Donaldson and um, uh, George Will and people like that, pretty high-flying company for my old friend Marty Nolan, a distinguished graduate of this school, by the way. And it suddenly dawned on me the uh, other statement that you can't take seriously anyone with whom you went to high school. <laughs> and there was Marty up there, and he was doing pretty well. Uh, and uh, so uh, part of this is the prejudice of familiarity. Uh, so uh, the people here then, first they're interested, but then they, they seem to turn. And uh, in response, uh, Jesus quotes the proverb that prophets are not honored in their hometown, but he gives two examples of uh, Israelite prophets who ministered to non-Jews. First, the example of Elijah, chapter, uh, rather, 1 Kings chapter 17, and then the example of Elisha, chapter 5 of 2 Kings. Now, these are some of the most interesting and intriguing figures in what we call the Old Testament. The stories about them are fascinating in their own right, and in fact, they are perhaps the best models from the Old Testament for the way the evangelists write about Jesus. Uh, these are prophetic figures who are also wonder workers, and they do extraordinary things. Luke is interested in the theme of prophetic uh, prophetic succession. We're all familiar with um, Luke as interested in apostolic succession, as he is, but he's also interested in, perhaps even more so, in prophetic succession. So right at the start, he puts Jesus in line with two great prophets of ancient Israel. In the body of his narrative about Jesus, Jesus doesn't do much ministry to non-Jews. But the early church, of course, does, and uh, so in, in a sense, he's uh, planting the seed for the Acts of the Apostles. Now, uh, what do we make out of all of this? Uh, let me uh, conclude the example, at least, by listing some possibilities and some problems. Let me begin with the problems. One problem is, what does fulfillment mean? Does that mean that we no longer need these texts, like Isaiah chapter 61 and 58? I think we do. Uh, a second problem is the rejection of all the people in the synagogue. Now, that can easily transfer to all the Jewish people. The third point is, and this has to be faced, is that in this second part, Luke is setting up a pattern that's going to happen all through the Acts of the Apostles. Paul and his, his uh, companions go first to the um, synagogues and they get a mixed reception, not entirely negative, but mixed, and then they go to the Gentiles. So these are three problems, I think. The nature of fulfillment,
the nature of and scope of the rejection and also the Lucan pattern of uh, at least partial rejection in going to the Gentiles. What then should preachers and teachers do who are concerned to uh, at least not encourage or not um, uh, foment anti-Judaism? I think it's uh, incumbent upon us to get an idea of what fulfillment is. Uh, when, we, when we speak about scripture being fulfilled in the New Testament, we mean it's reached its goal, but it, it doesn't mean that we should or can have a Bible without the Old Testament. The Christian Bible has both the Old and the New Testament, and I think, as I've said before, the New Testament is unintelligible without the Old. So that's one thing we can do. Secondly, I think we have to emphasize that not all of Israel here rejects the person of Jesus. Some people, uh, the people in Nazareth do, but obviously the first followers of Jesus were all Jews. Jesus spent his adult ministry uh, working uh, almost entirely for other Jewish people. The word became flesh in the land of Israel. Um, a third point is that the aim of the ministry of Jesus is to help his fellow Jews and uh, then Gentiles to recognize that uh, the God of Israel is the God of Jesus. In other words, uh, the God that he's preaching and that he's trying to help people to come to see is the only God, is the God who is revealed in the Jewish scriptures. And so the goal of his activity is that all might recognize the God of Jesus as the God of Israel. And fourth, uh, I think, to, uh, to emphasize the context of uh, this particular text and other texts in Jewish life of the first century. The whole thing about the synagogue service, the use of scrolls, uh, and things of that sort, the whole text, in a sense, is soaked in Judaism. And in fact, the uh, emphasis on prophetic succession, I think, is a very important theme for Christian preachers and teachers to emphasize. Pentecost wasn't the, uh, the complete new beginning of the story. Rather, the story in Luke's salvation historical view uh, stretches back to the time of Israel. Uh, it reaches a kind of high point in the time of Jesus and then continues on in the time of the Spirit or the time of the church. Let me conclude my uh, presentation with some final remarks. Christianity is an incarnational religion. With John the Evangelist, we, pre we profess that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Where the incarnation took place was the land of Israel among the Jewish people. The time was over 2,000 years ago. Then the land was part of the Roman Empire, and many people hoped that God's promises to his chosen people might somehow be fulfilled so that they might find peace and freedom in accord with their dignity as God's people. The introductions and textual studies in my book try to illustrate the positive value of reading gospel text in their original Jewish contexts. While the three synoptic gospels present a common vision of Jesus, they also present distinctive portraits of him. By attending to their Jewish settings and roots, as well as their literary and theological individuality, my volume attempts to present a positive and constructive approach toward reducing the anti-Jewish potential in certain gospel texts. The paradox, the, the paradox on which my book is based is that the more we study the gospels in their original Jewish context, the less we view them as anti-Jewish and the more we appreciate their richness and allow the word of God within them to speak to us. I have written this book as a Catholic Christian, and more specifically as an American Jesuit priest and a biblical scholar, one who preaches regularly. I am aware that other readers, uh, Christians and Jews alike, might see and say things differently. 
However, I am fully convinced that the key to understanding both testaments in the Christian Bible appears in what has long been one of my favorite biblical texts and an inspiration for my own work on Second Temple Judaism and the New Testament. Let me quote Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23. In those days, ten men of every nationality speaking different tongues shall take hold of, yes, take hold of every Jew by the edge of his garment and say, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Now, we will have a uh, series of uh, responses from my uh, colleagues here. Uh, the order will be um, David Michael first, Chris Layton second, Celia Sirwa third. And uh, I've asked them to look at my work, obviously, but also uh, to speak from their own experience and how they uh, perceive the problem, how they approach the problem, and what advice they might have for religious educators and um, preachers. So we'll start with Dave. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. It's a real honor for me to be able to follow you, Dan, in your presentation. I just wanted to say a word of personal deep appreciation for your work, both in terms of my own priestly formation in seminary days and in the work that I've done in almost 25 years of priestly ministry. I've often used your work, uh, your commentaries uh, uh, for scripture and um, in my professional work with regards to Christian-Jewish relations for the Archdiocese of Boston, have often used your insights to help. Uh, just one personal anecdote, a few years ago when I was assembling uh, some materials for folks on preaching and teaching the Passion, which is posted on our Archdiocesan website, one of the uh, pieces that I've given out dozens of times uh, at, at, when I was at Brandeis, all those years at Brandeis, and several times in parish work, and recently at St. John Chrysostom Parish in West Roxbury, is your very helpful scripture from scratch on who killed Jesus. Uh, I, I've given up thousands. I, I must have supported the Jesuit community, I'm sure. Thousands of those uh, uh, flyers, as well as Ray Brown has a very fine one as well. And in assembling this uh, material for the Archdiocesan website, realized that, as I went online with the St. Anthony Messenger Press, that your uh, piece on Who Killed Jesus was not posted online. So I, I gave them a phone call and said that I was uh, working in Catholic Jewish relations here in Boston and had often found your piece to be very valuable in my work and would they consider posting it online? And they said, thank you, yes we will. So as a result, there's a nice link now from the Archdiocese website to your work, so thank you. In my um, almost nine years of experience as Catholic chaplain at Brandeis University where I was full time, on that campus, as you know, it's a campus where the, 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 the it's predominantly Jewish world there, something between 50 and 60 percent of the undergraduates are, are Jewish. Uh, I figured that in almost nine years there that I, I preached the, the better part of three complete Sunday lectionary cycles there, and uh, also uh, probably four weekday cycles. And it's, uh, you know, Mary Boys has this concept of, of, of learning and listening and learning in the presence of the other. And, Boy, that's a place to really to do this with these scriptures on the Brandeis campus. And uh, one example that, that comes to mind is uh, opening Sunday, which would usually be around the end of August. And uh, in the Markin cycle, I found that opening Sunday, uh, for some reason, always seemed to would land on the, the reading of Mark chapter 7. Now, when you're a, 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 <laughs> right, when you're a chaplain, uh, of graduate and undergraduate students, and it's opening Sunday, and you're welcoming new students, international students and local students. You, you, you hope to have something that you can preach, perhaps about discipleship, follow me, come and see, something like this, or even perhaps the uh, prodigal son story, something like this. Instead, what, what I get on opening Sunday every third year was this conflict with the scribes and the Pharisees, in which Jesus accuses them of hypocrisy and their religious observances, including the purity rules concerning food. Now this on a campus where immediately after the 11 o'clock mass, the students would walk across the campus to the dining hall with signs clearly separating two sides, kosher food and non-kosher food. 
So it began to pose very interesting questions for me, very real on the ground questions for me, because I felt I, I had a specific responsibility to preach the scriptures in this way that were faithful to the, to the, to the, to the gospel and yet not fomenting these anti-Jewish stereotypes. It was an interesting challenge over all those years. Um, and I want to just speak for a few moments about the challenges inherent in, and here I'm addressing my remarks to preaching. It's, as we all know, certainly it's not the only way that the church exercises its ministry of the word. We think of the religious education programs in our parishes, the RCIA programs, the Bible studies, the <laughs> programs such as we have here in the Archdiocese of Boston, the Arise Together in Christ program, formation of candidates for ministry, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to just reflect on the challenges inherent in preaching for a few moments, which of course is in the context of the liturgy. And in the interest of brevity, I'll focus on three challenges. There are of course many others. The first would be the awareness of the preacher concerning the mandate and the implications of Nostra Aetate and the developing post-Vatican II magisterium of the church apropos of our relations with the Jews. And the second challenge would be getting good practical scholarship to the preachers. Well, I can anticipate answering that already by saying that Dan's book, which I had the opportunity to read, is a, a wonderful uh, tool for preachers because it's so very practical in following the outline of the lectionary. So thank you for, for having the imagination to put your scholarship together in that way. And, and thirdly, the integrity for the preaching task as such. Um, the, the, the need to influence or shape the awareness of the preacher, however you want to say it, concerning the need to preach without the default positions of this long Christian inheritance of anti-Jewish distortions and stereotypes or of supersessionism, uh, which I, you know, supersessionism, my covenant cancels your covenant, essentially. So how do we raise the awareness of those who are going to preach not to fall back on this default position, this long Christian inheritance? Um, and we've already seen Nostra Aetate, the call of Nostra Aetate, the mandate not to preach anything that is not in accord with the truth of the gospel of the spirit of Jesus Christ. The notes that uh, Audrey mentioned in her introduction that speak of the Jews not occupying an occasional or marginal place in catechesis, but their presence should, there is essential and in, in organically integrated because our roots spring from, from Judaism. And so given all of the complex demands of parish ministry today and the complexity of our world today, getting preachers even to begin to think this way, to pay attention to this need to do so is enormously difficult. It's a real challenge. <clears throat> and yet the, the, the church's post-Vatican II encounter with Judaism as a living reality. That's, that's uh, the, the richness of the encounter is that, that we, we, we see Judaism not simply as a religion in a book 2,000 years old and older than that, but as a living reality. And this has led to our on, ongoing engagement with our own Jewish roots as, as Christians. So the result of this process of this encounter with Judaism as a living reality has been both a process of dismantling and, if you'll pardon my making up a word, remantling or rebuilding. Our encounter with Judaism has both its internal and external dimension. Internally, it means, first of all, for Christians, the need to dismantle the long, sad tradition aptly called the teaching of contempt for Jews and Judaism, and I think that's happening. But also positively, it means that our encounter with Judaism as a living reality challenges us Christians to re-articulate our own self-understanding in those places where our past distortions of Judaism may have distorted our self-understanding. In other words, if, if I think we have to take very seriously John Paul II's insistence that Christians and Jews are intrinsically linked at the very level of our identities. What are the implications for us if we really take that seriously and we've begun to engage that in our encounter with Judaism as a living reality? So it's not only dismantling the teaching of contempt because, as John Paul II said, erroneous and unjust uh, uh, interpretations of the New Testament with regards to alleged Jewish cult Billy for the death of Jesus have, have created this problem, but also positively because Christians and Jews, at least from our perspective, are linked at the very level of our identity. So we have this dismantling and we have also this rebuilding. So on the one hand, you know, we can put together a list of do's and don'ts. Don't say this, don't do that for preachers. Um, but we also have to provide a way of thinking and reflecting and expressing that isn't just an avoidance of anti-Jewish stereotypes or distortions, but we have to provide for preachers a way to have a deeper appreciation of what it means to speak out of the context of our Jewish roots. 
and what that does to enrich our understanding of the gospel. And I think the, 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 the former is easier to do, the dismantling of the history. When we're in the realm of history, that's an easier thing to dismantle than it seems to me the ability to learn how to think in terms of the context of uh, being rooted in Judaism as Christians. Um, so as, as, as you have already mentioned, you know, how do we understand the categories of fulfillment? Uh, by the way, I think the Pontifical Biblical Commission's document on the Jewish, uh, on Jews and Judaism and Christian scriptures has a magnificent section on fulfillment, a very nuanced, very rich understanding of fulfillment. And how do we understand what that means? If, if, and we have, I think it's fair to say, and I still see this frequently, that fulfillment essentially means the obliteration of the other. And yet that, that certainly is not what we mean when we speak of fulfillment, and yet it's easy for us to fall back on that kind of default position. How do we understand inerrancy? How do we understand inspiration? And so forth. So it's a whole set of ways for preachers to understand how to interpret a gospel in light of this new encounter. That's a huge challenge, and it's an ongoing one. The second challenge I already mentioned was this getting of good scholarship into the hands of preachers. And as essential as good commentaries are, most preachers are not going to consult a tome. Over the years, Dan, as you know, I've invited you on a couple of occasions to address folks from the archdiocese, preachers and teachers, and you've always been very generous. And I remember your quip uh, in saying that the admirable and uh, wonderful scholar Ray Brown often gives you more information than you really need. <laughs> and uh, so when we look at these large volumes on John of Ray Brown, they're magisterial and yet Right, so we need the kind of work that you're doing in terms of getting this very, very practical scholarship into the hands of preachers and teachers and Bible study leaders. Finally, respecting the integrity of what preaching is, that it is within the context of the liturgy and that it is a proclamation of the living gospel of mercy for the salvation of the world. In other words, the job of the preacher is to proclaim the gospel, not to explain the history. This is a very tricky balance. I don't think the homily can bear the weight of, of a constant explanation of the history for the sake of Christian-Jewish relations, as, as important as is for the history to inform the preacher's understanding of, of preaching the gospel. So it's, it's, it's a tough balance there. I know because I tried over the years. I tried and I found that you know, after a while I was just simply explaining history. and You can get caught up simply in explaining the history. So what we need to do is to provide a context for a preacher to be able to faithfully interpret the scriptures so as to be able to proclaim the gospel as God's living and saving action in the world without distorting or negating the Judaism out of which it springs. To quote another great preacher with excellent credentials, salvation is from the Jews. Let me just give one quick example. Good Friday. Uh, we all know that we read the Passion of John on Good Friday. The directive in the ritual says, after the passion is proclaimed, a brief homily may be given. So on the one hand, you've got this large text with all of this potential for anti-Judaism that's built into it. The task of the preacher is to proclaim this living encounter, this gospel, this living encounter with the word, this gospel for the salvation of all, in a way that, is, that takes account of this very complex and negative history while being relevant and engaging in five minutes. You see, you see the problem that's there. Efforts, um, we could go on at length about efforts that are taking place here in the Archdiocese, formation and education in the Archdiocese, our Office for Ecumenical Interreligious Affairs, our relationship with local Jewish leaders are very strong. Parish, uh, our Archdiocesan website as a means to get information to, to folks, mailings that we do to priests and so forth on our new uh, ecumenical commission, which I think is an excellent new commission uh, to help us to uh, extend the work of the office into parish life here in the Archdiocese. And of course, you ask us to also to look at setbacks. Well, progress in any relationship is never merely linear, as we know. Any relationship is complex. I, I, on occasion, joke with a friend of mine from ADL asking, how is it possible for me to go to bed on a Sunday night thinking that all is well in the world of Catholic-Jewish relations, only to discover on Monday morning over a cup of coffee in the newspaper that they were in the midst of another crisis? <laughs> and uh, sometimes a little humor helps to give one perspective. 
But I would say that I think often of Rabbi Lian Klinicki, who said that dialogue needs to be more than tea and sympathy. And by that, he meant that uh, in our local relations, certainly in our relations throughout the world, that we need to talk to one another frankly about the hard issues, the issues where we agree and the issues where we disagree and we diverge, and this is not easy to do. We have to express our concerns respectfully and forthrightly, but to listen without becoming defensive or resentful is very difficult. It's very difficult to do that. But I think that our local Jewish partners certainly understand that, they respect that, and we try to do that. We don't want to lose the extraordinary and community-changing momentum and commitment of the post Nostra Aetate Church. And indeed, we want to press forward, even if sometimes it's unsettling to our own self-understanding to do so. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, if it's all right, I'm going to stand up. You know, we Protestants are a restless people. <laughs> we have a hard time standing in one place for very long. And furthermore, I want to be able to see you should I offend you. And should you want to throw any shoes in my direction, I'll be in a better position to dodge. Um, I'd, I'd like to begin by thanking Boston College. Uh, its faculty and graduates have done so much over the years to change the landscape of Catholic-Jewish relations. Indeed, the Center for Christian um, Jewish Learning has served as a hub for the best thinking in the field, and I'm particularly grateful that it's worked so hard at translating the best of academic scholarship so that it can transform congregational realities and actually make contact with the ground. It's furthermore a very special honor for me to speak on this occasion when we recognize Dan Harrington and his extraordinary work over the years. I want to tell you a little story um, to set the stage. 20 years ago, um, I bumbled into the basement of St. Vincent de Paul Church at, at the invitation of, of uh, Father Dick Lawrence, where a royal Shakespearean trained actor named Paul Alexander was performing the Gospel of John, which he had committed to memory its, in its entirety. It took approximately two hours and 10 or 15 minutes to do the entire recitation. And he gave a stunning performance. I mean, everyone in that basement was profoundly moved. And I was moved, and I was also deeply unsettled. So the next day, somehow, I found a way to have coffee with Paul. And I asked him if he would be willing to jump across the pond once again, come back from England um, a few months later and perform the Gospel of John for a mixed group of Christians and Jews well represented with rabbis, ministers, and priests. And remarkably enough, he was intrigued and agreed to come back. So Paul um, came to St. Mary's Seminary where he performed the Gospel of John to a group of approximately 200 Christians and Jews, pretty well balanced in number. And the constant allusions to the Jews had the entire audience really squirming. Enormous discomfort at the accumulative rhetorical power of the discourse, the polemical discourse. So after the performance, um, everyone had to shake the, the uh, tension out of their bones and, and uh, we had um, dinner. And then after dinner, Dan Harrington put the gospel into its historical context and helped um, diffuse a, a very tense situation in a way that led 
the participants to say, henceforth, we want to learn and study together by and examining closely our sacred texts. So Dan's experience with us at the ICJS 20-some years ago left a very deep imprint in two ways. One is he underscored then as now the importance of placing biblical texts, particularly New Testament texts, within their literary and historical context. And two, he underscored the importance of listening, interpreting, and studying in the presence of the other, a characteristic and a, a mandate, if you will, that, that uh, David, you've alert, um, alluded to as well, and Mary Boys does um, finally. But having said that, and having um, recognized how essential this is, I would like to share with you um, some thoughts about what happens when one indeed goes to town on, begins to work with texts like Luke 4 with Jewish interlocutors. What kind of excitement, what kind of uh, ruckus gets made? Um, and I think that the first thing that I, I want to say is that, that I become keenly aware in studying with Christians and Jews, in this case, not just with rabbis and Jewish scholars, but with Jewish lay folks, the limitations of historical criticism. The significance um, of the text is not confined to the meaning of its original context. And I think um, Dan agrees with this, that you therefore need not only to study the text, you need to study the history of its interpretation and see what Christians, and to, in some cases Jews, have made of this text over the centuries. Does this feel like it's whining at you? Sorry about that. Is, this, is that better? How's that? Can, you can hear me now without that annoying screech. Um, so there's a need to, to, um, to, to, to study the history of a text interpretation. But I also think that there is a need to do the kind of imaginative, playful engagement with the text that comes so naturally to Jews. Now this isn't easy for a staid, uptight Presbyterian like myself to learn, but the following kinds of, of uh, conversations begin to um, occur when you do this with Jews. <clears throat> when you look at Luke 4 and the recitation of this very powerful messianic dream, this hope, this expectation, the synagogue crowd is with him, immediately following his sermon, even when he's saying it's been fulfilled in your midst today, they're with him. So the question um, that my Jewish friends ask, so what, what caused the turn? They're with him one moment, and then they turn against him, why did things go sour. And here is where the Midrashic imagination comes into play. And what I find that my rabbinic colleagues wanting to do is to linger on this gap, this hiatus. What occurred that might allow us empathetically to enter into the story in such a way as you get a better feel for the internal texture of the text. And, and they linger on this question. Who is rejecting whom here? Who's rejecting whom? They're with them. And there's this question that's, that's raised. Is this not Joseph's son? Right? Well, so is, is, this, is this the question that takes the shape of, hey, that's Joe's boy. Hey, he's made good. 
or is it a question that has an edge to it that somehow is intended to discredit? How, how do you play with, with that question? What is the nature of that question? And a great deal hinges on how you hear that question. Is it an inflammatory question? Is it a rhetorical question? Is it a polemical question? Is it an honest question? You know, I can't believe what's happened to him. He must have gotten some education since last we saw. So um, again, I want to give you a, the, the sense that the, the value, the importance of studying in the presence of the other means one brings to bear a set of questions that may not naturally occur to oneself and one learns, if you will, to circle the text and come at it and get inside in a different way. Um, the, the second um, example I want to provide on Luke uh, 4, this text from Luke 4, um, is a response to what has been the predominant paradigm and the predominant paradigm, it seems to me, Dan's um, work does not undo. It simply recognizes this is the problem. Um, if, can we, have you had distributed a, a set of commentaries um, by some Protestants, including, including John Calvin, um, Alan Culpepper, and uh, I, I believe Jack Sanders? Um, I, want, I want you to listen to this commentary by Alan Culpepper for a moment. And Alan Culpepper, um, I believe, Dan, you'll, you'll know, is a, is a Baptist New Testament um, scholar, very thoughtful, very capable. But, but this is his um, commentary, which is the, in the New Interpreter's Bible, used by ministers and priests widely. Um, a very fine piece of work. But this is his commentary on Luke 4. His actions, Jesus' actions, fulfill the scriptures, especially the prophets, but even those who awaited the fulfillment of the scriptures took offense at Jesus and eventually put him to death. Okay, you can see I'm jumping to the middle of this text. The scene suggests that the basis for their hostility toward Jesus was a difference in the way they read the scriptures. The people of Jesus' hometown read the scriptures as promises of God's exclusive covenant with them, a covenant that involves promises of deliverance from their oppressors. Jesus came announcing deliverance, but it was not a national deliverance, but God's promise of liberation for all the poor and oppress regardless of nationality, gender, or race. When the radical inclusiveness of Jesus' announcement became clear in those gathered in the synagogue in Nazareth, their commitment to their own community boundaries took precedence over their joy that God had sent a prophet among them. In the end, because they were not open to the prospect of others sharing in the bounty of God's deliverance, they themselves were unable to receive it. Now, this interpretation, along with many, many others throughout the history of Christian interpretation, yield an image or enshrine an image of the Jews that suggests they are ethnocentric, they are joyless, they are fickle, changing their minds, and they all too easily turn murderous when offended. So this dominant paradigm seems to me to be um, answering a question, or at least the question that interpreters have thought Luke 4 is trying to address, is the question, why did the Jewish people not accept 
Jesus when he came to them and actualized messianic promises. And the answer given by this text, at least as it's been ter interpreted over the years, is Jesus came to his own. His own did not accept him. As a consequence of their rejection of Jesus, God rejects the Jews. And so the scandal that Christianity did not take hold amongst the Jewish people is resolved by this text by locating the problem within the Jewish people. And one gets insiders and outsiders. The text pits Jews and Christians in opposition, in adversarial relationship to each other. So in studying this text with um, some of my Jewish colleagues, the following um, kind of query has been pursued. Let's imagine a totally different scenario in which there is an internal squabble occurring. Let's imagine a community comprised of Jewish followers of Jesus and Gentile followers of Jesus. And this community, this mixed community, this diverse community, this community of splintered theological and literary understandings is having a heck of a time being a community. How do you know they're having difficulty being a community? Because they can't even eat together. And if you can't eat together, as any good Jew knows, then you're in trouble. So the text is, if you will, designed to address those members within the community who are anchored within a more deeply Jewish worldview. And it's trying to encourage them to say, look, you need to be able to sit at the same table. You need to be able to be in communion with these Gentile followers of Jesus. And there is a precedent. If Elijah will accept food from a non-Jew, well, then you ought to be able and willing to do the same. And if there are dealings that can occur with somebody who falls within the category of impurity, indeed is paradigmatically impure, so you should be willing to have dealings with Gentile followers of Jesus as well. So the illusions and the force of the text is not to polarize, to splinter Christians and Jews into warring factions in which one gets elevation by standing on the backs of the other, but instead to see this as a struggle for a community to be inclusive enough that it can affirm and embrace the diversity within its own ranks. And so understood, this text becomes a text that should challenge us to ask about the character of our own inclusivity within our own communities. And what issues of purity and impurity, what issues of taboo do we use in our own time, if you will, to make that homiletical leap? What, issue, what taboos do we use in our own um, time to set the boundaries between insiders and outsiders that so oftentimes create internecine tensions within our communities. So the story, um, again, at the, at the encouragement of, of some of my rabbinic colleagues is, let's just imagine a community where the key issue is dealing with one's own diversity, not a story that is set up and advances one people's theological agenda at the expense of the others. Those are two, um, if you will, attempts to demonstrate or try to underscore why it's worthwhile sitting down with and huddling around our sacred narratives with our Jewish colleagues and hammering away at these texts 
because one realizes that one does one's best thinking and one is most spiritually challenged not by remaining within the comforts of one's own enclave, but by stepping out and feeling the press and the urgency of looking at and interpreting the world through new eyes, different eyes. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> it's a distinct privilege for me to have been invited to participate in this conversation, uh, recognizing the contribution of uh, Father Dan Harrington. The New Directions project that I represent uh, originated in an informal conversation that took place between uh, Cardinal Bernard Law, who was then Archbishop of Boston, and the late Lenny Zakem, um, who was the uh, director of the New England office of the Anti-Defamation League at the time. And their idea was to create an educational initiative that would serve people at the grassroots, uh, the people who would never be sitting in this audience, the, the people who would, would, all due respect, not be reading Father Harrington's commentaries. Um, <laughs> And the idea, the idea was that we prepare religious educators, those who teach at the grassroots, our catechists, who are for the most part volunteers, uh, and religious educators in the Jewish tradition, again, at the very grassroots, to prepare them, and this is important, not to teach the other's tradition. Because if you talk to religious educators from either tradition, uh, they will tell you that they have all they can do to teach their own tradition, and, and they cannot take on uh, teaching another. However, the idea was to prepare them so that when, as they teach their own tradition, they find themselves talking about the other's tradition, which happens more often than we might think, that they would be able to do so responsibly that is, with information that was correct and respectfully, with an appropriate deference to the other's tradition. Naomi Tovim, whom, to whom you were introduced at the beginning, and I were drafted by our respective communities to put flesh on this idea. And so the New Directions Project, as it's often referred to, was born. Our idea took the form of a workshop that we tried to offer to religious educators first in the Catholic community since we were the overwhelming majority and just in terms of sheer numbers here. Uh, and more recently, we have been working as well with Jewish educators. We have covered uh, most of the Archdiocese of Boston. I think we have visited many, if not most, of the parishes of the Archdiocese with our workshop. And I should say here that very early in this process, the workshop became a requirement for catechist certification in the Archdiocese. And so that did serve to keep us busy. We've worked in New England and um, in, in Rhode Island and New Hampshire in Connecticut, as well as in the western part of the state, which is the Diocese of Fall River. Uh, and, and so we, we've talked to a lot of people. We worked with a lot of catechists. And out of that experience, uh, I see two challenges that I would put on the table. The first is the lack of education, religious education, uh, on the part of the vast majority of our people in the pews. I was struck in the description of, of uh, Father Harrington's presentation with the quote from Nostra Aetate that refers to the truth of the gospel. That is a simple statement. And yet, for many of the people with whom we work, the truth of the gospel is, is very basic, literal truth. 
The people that we're working with have not been introduced to critical approaches to the text. They come to the text totally open, and they hear it and take it at face value. And so the challenge that I see, and, and I think it's probably just that I'm getting old, uh, but I, I'm beginning to recognize that although we have spoken to many edu educators in many parts of the archdiocese and beyond, that I am not sure that they are able even to begin to understand and appropriate what we are trying to say to them because we are assuming that they have more information than they actually do. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Is that we are greeted warmly in the parishes. They are open to what we have to say. They embrace Naomi and they are eager to tell us how their best friend growing up was Jewish. So it is not a case of people's hearts not being open. But the challenge is that they don't have a, a place, they don't have a paradigm to, where they can put this information that we are giving them. They take the text at face value. They don't have the benefit of the kind of information that we're all here today taking for granted. Um, and therefore, they, when we finish a workshop, many go away determined to do something. What we want them to do is to teach with this consciousness now uh, of, and, and use some of the strategies we've given them to look at the text and to recognize how the text might continue to perpetuate uh, a teaching of contempt. But instead, they come back with decisions like, maybe we'll have a Seder, <laughs> which is, of course, completely counterintuitive. It's not it's what we don't want them to do without at least collaborating with their local Jewish community. My, my point is that I, I think that there is still, if we're going to talk about taking what we're talking about here to the vast majority of God's people, um, we, we have to be conscious that they need a very basic introduction to the way we in our community understand the truth of the gospel. This has not happened. The, many of our people do not appreciate the nature of the gospels. And therefore, I'm convinced, uh, and, and it saddens me, I guess, to some extent, but I'm convinced that much of our work has not and cannot penetrate and, and become a, a, an a part of their, their way of teaching because they don't have that fundamental basis uh, on which we can build. Um, that to me is the biggest challenge. Uh, it's the challenge of education. We have been much more successful, obviously, in working with our directors of religious education, many of them who hold degrees from this school of ministry and others, um, and yet, um, they are working with people who are volunteers, very generous, very open, and yet lacking that fundamental uh, ability. And that's a big stopper. That is a big issue. Um, I don't know how we solve it, and if I did, uh, I could probably uh, make a fortune uh, trying to <laughs> sell it to uh, Paulus Press and, and everybody else. But I don't know how we get around that. Um, the other, the other point that, that I would say is a challenge uh, is that I remember in the very beginning of this work that we've been doing, we've been very much involved in the work here at the center, um, and uh, the, the center has always been very generous in including the New Directions project. And I remember uh, a conversation that was had uh, early on where a number of Jewish and Catholic uh, educators were gathered, and it was Dr. John Clabeau, who was at the time teaching New Testament at St. John's Seminary, who made the point that there was a need to bridge the gap between biblical scholarship and theology. And, and that gets translated uh, in 
our experience at the grassroots when religious educators will say to us, we're trying hard to form our catechists according to this way of thinking, to get them to read the text in a different way, to get them to see the danger of taking them at face value and letting the, the, the children think that the Pharisees are all got enemies of Jesus and so forth. Um, and, and, and yet they say, and yet, and, and yet, when those same children go to church, they're not hearing that message from the pulpit. Do, do you see? The, the problem is, again, that I think we have done great work. Uh, I think, especially in this part of the country, in, in many academic communities, this is a live issue. This is an, an issue that is, excites us and, and that encourages us to be better at the work that we do. But the thing is that it's not been integrated. It, it's not the way things are done. It becomes an add-on. It's an add-on in programs of ministry. It's not required. Uh, and so it's a piece that, that it, in my view, is not well integrated. And, and so you can have an issue like the Mel Gibson problem, which was raised for us a few years ago. And it was striking, I think, and, and difficult for the Jewish community to see that with all the attention we have given to Nostra Aetate, the response across the country in the Catholic world <laughs> was very mixed. Um, that, that not everyone could appreciate the dangers that, that, that were inherent in some of that presentation and some of that interpretation of, of the passion. In fact, there were places that were busing people to see the movie. Uh, we, and, and, and I remember distinctly at the time, uh, Michael Cook, the rabbi who teaches Christian scriptures uh, in, in, a, in a rabbinic school, actually saying to us that, that the Mel Gibson episode was the first real challenge, as he saw it, to Nostra Aetate, and, and that we had not acquitted ourselves very well. And, and, and I don't think it's a lack of goodwill, don't get me wrong. I think it's that this understanding that we share here in this room is not, is not integrated into the way we form our preachers, into the way we form our future ministers. So that if they're lucky, it's an add-on. But if they're not, then not much is going to change. And I, uh, I want to rest my case right here. Thank you. <laughs> Audrey suggested that if the panelists want to speak among themselves briefly, that we might do so, and then open it up uh, to the audience in general. Does anybody want to say anything to anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> Let me say how much I appreciate what the panelists did. Uh, and I think they sort of uh, added great depth and great significance to uh, my modest proposal, if you will. And they also showed us, you know, some of the great possibilities. I especially uh, appreciated Chris's point about midrashic thinking and worrying about a text. I think that's very important for uh, Christians to learn. Uh, and uh, also uh, how uh, both Celia and David spoke from the perspective of people in uh, the middle of pastoral activity and how uh, important that is and how on the one hand there are great possibilities, but on the other hand, we've got a long way to go. Would anybody else like to speak on it? Please, go ahead. I, I'd love to ask um, you what you what you make of this, uh, this question of fulfillment and thinking about fulfillment. Um, I heard Kendall Sulin um, once say that a prophecy can be fulfilled as a promise. And what that means is not that the prophecy has been exhausted in its realization, which clearly in this case it has not been, but that the promise of the prophecy in being fulfilled is being affirmed and verified as a legitimate and appropriate hope to have inspire and move the community. 
So to think of fulfillment in those terms rather than in its exhaustive realization. Yes, I would certainly agree with that. I, I, I've, I've, I've spent a good deal of time working on the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I always find that a helpful analogy to what the early church was doing. In other words, they were taking the Hebrew scriptures very seriously and poring over them and studying them and trying to see how there was a, an analogy or a, a relationship between those scriptures and their own life and history. And I think the early Christians did the same thing. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that they threw the scriptures away. Rather, they felt that now we finally understand these things. Mm -hmm. The penny drops, as it were. So I, I, uh, this morning, I spent uh, uh, my whole Second Temple Judaism class on the suffering servant. And again, that's, I think, an excellent example that uh, on the one hand, I don't think you can understand the way the Gospels present the person of Jesus without knowing those texts and without hearing the echoes that are spread through uh, all the Gospels. And on the other hand, those same texts stand as magnificent monuments of uh, Israelite piety, but also of Jewish piety throughout the centuries. Uh, so uh, I think fulfillment isn't... Uh, supersession or it isn't abrogation, rather it reaches something far more uh, profound uh, along those lines. So I think we can open up. This is a wonderful um, group of people to think through these things. Most of the people I know in this room uh, are great theologians, great biblical scholars, great religious educators. Uh, Celia has shown the problems as, as uh, David and Chris. Uh, what do you think we should do next? <laughs> I invite your wisdom. Fame. Yeah, I have about three comments, and these are coming from the pastoral side. Okay, I've had an adult Bible study in the parish for 18 years, mostly senior citizens. Guess what they can learn? They, not academically, but from the gut. So the question about this gospel thing was, well, what did Mary wind up thinking mm -hmm. about this? And didn't she tell them? It was sort of where they started. But that's a way of getting people into putting other characters there. It's very Ignatian, imagining themselves, beginning to think they might have been on different sides. So people can learn that, and they can learn it in the homiletic <laughs> sense. The quote from Culpepper that you have here, represents another problem, and that, that's a problem that Amy Jo Levine, who's been here, has criticized in liberation theology, which is wanting to set up our liberation Christian gospel, and therefore jumping on those. The hardest problem, it seems to me, you mentioned, Dan, and didn't come back to, and that's this business of the angry God, who's now shifting over to being the Muslim God rather than the Jewish God, uh, some of the things we've had with the clergy council and ecumenical things in Wales have dealt with this, but uh, that problem versus the angry God and the Christian God of love, that's really where I throw my hands up. It just keeps coming back and back and back. Thank you. Please. I'm a member of a largely African American Protestant. Typically, sermons run 45 minutes, sometimes an hour. And there we do have this midrashic you know, exploration of the text. It's part of the way preachers keep their audience engaged in 45 minutes an hour. I'm not sure I'm going to recommend that to the Catholic Church. That I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. no. so It's a matter of how you define terms. My sense of the Gospels is not simply that some of the tensions between 
Gentile followers of Jesus and Jewish followers of Jesus within what we now call the church are expressed by the Gospels, but also tensions and growing even hostility between Jewish followers of Jesus and those Jews who did not follow Jesus. And that the Gospels are actually expressing some of that hostility and that we have to sort of face that reality. It would be nice to have the kind of rose-colored glasses that this is just later interpretation, but I, I, could you just speak to that for a second? Do you, do you really believe that the gospel writers or the community that produced the gospels didn't have already have that, that tension, that, that even hostility between those two groups, even if it's within what we now think of as Judaism? Well, uh, my friends can, can, can speak to this also, but the way I would come to this is to look at Sef Second Temple Judaism. This was not necessarily polite society. There were a lot of Jewish groups floating around. There were many ways of being a Jew. One could be a Pharisee or a Sadducee or a Zealot or a Samaritan or a Christian. And, uh, and the way these... Uh, people, uh, and this is all over the Mediterranean world, by the way, this isn't distinctive to Israel. You get the same things from Greek philosophical schools, that uh, it isn't like polite academic society that we populate, uh, where, Professor, uh, I very much appreciated your paper, but, uh, and you're always waiting for the but, but uh, in, in uh, the Mediterranean world, people got right into it. There was no introduction, it was but from the start. What, what I'm saying is that, that it's, it's not uh, unexpected or unusual that there should be tensions within um, groups within Judaism, as there are today, as there are in Catholic circles uh, uh, the same way. Uh, so uh, I, again, I would understand Matthew and also John basically as family quarrels, uh, which as we know can be the worst kind of quarrels. And I think the problem comes when you sort of over-theologize these things or sort of take them out of their historical context and blow them up into Christians and Jews. So I, I think, uh, again, my fundamental thesis, which is, I admit is a modest one, uh, is that uh, the more we place these texts in their first century historical context, uh, the less likely they are to actualize their anti-Jewish potential. At least that's the way I would come at your question. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree, Dan, but I think that, but. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Polite society. <laughs> but as, as, and here I will focus on the, the task of preaching because it is so formative in, in, the, in the lives of our communities. The preacher is still responsible, in this case, of <clears throat> preaching at mass for what he says. And, um, So I think we have to find ways in, in which to, to challenge preachers um, to think with a little more nuance. Um, in some ways, it's a very difficult task to preach. In other ways, it's, it's certainly, it's routine, it's what's expected of us. And what we have to do is somehow to create ways for preachers to think when they look at text to see these nuances there and not at least to do no harm at least to start there, do no harm, not to perpetuate. It's so easy for preachers to say things like, well, the Pharisees were hypocrites. I would rather say something like this. If Jesus is, in fact, pointing out hypocrisy, he very well may be standing right within his own Jewish tradition, the prophetic tradition in doing so. Where is there not hypocrisy in, in religious practice? Does anyone have a monopoly on hypocrisy? I mean, I think that's a place to sort of begin. It, we, we're not talking, I think, necessarily in, in PhD level scholarship for the preachers, but just simply in these ways of being responsible for what we say, for how we unpack the reading, for the kind of nuance that we, we bring to our interpretation of the reading. But it's easy, we have these default positions. It's very, very easy for us, and in some ways, it's lazy. It's lazy thinking. And I think it's that kind of thing in the preaching from the pulpit that we need to kind of point out, we need to challenge, and a book like yours, I think, goes a long way toward that. Could I, could I also oh, add yeah, that, you know, I think there's no such thing as the definitive homily. 
Finally, after 24 years of priesthood, I've let myself off the hook for that. It's never going to all get done in one homily. There are bad homilies, of course, but there's no such thing as the definitive homily. I think what we need to, to, to look at is a total picture of parish life here and that we have to be committed as pastors or as pastoral leaders in our parishes to the whole picture, to a whole program of ongoing faith formation for our adults, for a whole program of ongoing education for our religious educators, yes, even our volunteer religious educators, for a whole program of ecumenical and interreligious relations in the local community, inviting interreligious guests into our community, for getting out good literature to our people. It's, it's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not going to happen in the course of six months. You're not going to transform people's thinking in the course of six months or a year. You're talking about years. But you're talking about a whole commitment to this as a whole project, a whole way of being a faith community. And I think if we think in those terms, in some ways, it's be a little bit overwhelming to look at the big picture. But in other ways, that's a more natural way for us, I think, to do things. So it's easy to get overwhelmed with the challenges and the complexity of the thing. But I think one way to pick away at that is little by little, in every dimension, ask yourself if you're a pastoral leader, if you have responsibility for pastoral leadership in your parish, how can I bring this insight to, to what it is I'm doing? Could I invite a, a, the rabbi in to speak about the psalm? So there's some common ground for us right there, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Thank you. Chris, go ahead. Um, Dan, I want to p point out a certain irony here. Um, I, I think your proposal about th thinking of anti-Judaism as layered on top of the New Testament text um, sounds very Protestant to me. Um, it, 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 Protestant in the sense that, that the proposal or the, the recommendation is that one, in a sense, hurdles over 2,000 years of interpretation. Now, I know I'm um, overstating the case. But, but just as Robert Wilkins says, whenever a reform occurs within the church, it's done in terms of going back to a golden age, a mythic beginning, and then correcting the excesses in terms of that original um, vision of how things were at the, at the very beginning. Um, I, I, I'm the one who's kind of Catholic here in thinking that you can't get back to a pristine beginning because the tradition is so woven into the texture of the community that 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 comes with the text itself. And so to, to um, imagine the text as Jewish text, and therefore, by definition, it can't be um, anti-Jewish. They can certainly be polemical, but they can't be anti-Jewish. Registers, um, to, to, to some degree, as, as mirroring some of the strategies that are all too familiar to me as a Protestant. And uh, I would urge you to, to, um, um, to, to some degree, rec I don't know, recognize, um, consider that, that this may not get you all that far to, to begin with because the problem is how the text has been received and lived in the community over the centuries. And therefore, you cannot um, separate the meaning of the text as it lived at the time when it was originally composed from the way in which it has been incarnate within the tradition over the centuries. OK, let me be a Protestant. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think you know, one of the emphases of the Second Vatican Council was back to the sources, and particularly back to the scriptures. And you know the the idea that I have is that uh, the the scriptures can help us to refine that uh, tradition and to look at parts of it that perhaps got uh, pushed out of the way or fell by the wayside for good or bad reasons. And I think that that the return to the scriptures uh, has been a very healthy dimension in Catholic life and has. Uh, begun to work its way, at least I hope it does, uh, in um, a more fully into the life of the church. Uh, it's, uh, I think in a sense, it's uh, 
a program for the long haul. In mm -hmm. other words, it's not going to happen next week or next uh, year or, or, or whatever, but rather it is something that we have to keep working away at. And again, the agents of this are religious educators and preachers. And I think uh, practically everybody here fits that kind of definition. And I think it's important uh, uh, to uh, try to understand the scriptures as best we can uh, as to what they say, and particularly what they do not say. And I, I think uh, something new will emerge out of that kind of process. Yeah. So that would be my view. Of that. Yeah, and no, no disagreement there. Um, I, I think this is exactly work that needs to be done. Um, the severity of the problem, I'm, I am thoroughly a Presbyterian and, and have never been accused of being upbeat. <laughs> <laughs> Can I can I stay, oh can I can I just add here? Um, oh please. I'm yes, sorry. I just wanted to say that that I think your work, uh, Dan, has has really contributed to even the problem that I seem so concerned about, uh, because it is you, what you do in your work is that integration. I think, uh, and um, and I think your work is. I, I was I, I pulled this book out. I, I think uh, as important uh, as this one is this one, a very basic introduction to the nature of the Gospels. Uh, because I think that before our people at the grassroots, the people for whom I'm advocating, can, can get there, they need to come here. And, and I think you are one of those rare individuals who can, who can do the whole thing. Uh, and, and, you know, and that's what we need. We need that more holistic approach uh, to this problem. Um, well, I just wanted to follow on Dan's response to you, Christopher, by saying that if you go back to the scriptures not knowing very much about them already, in some ways you're ready to learn for the first time. Uh, I'm being a little whimsical about my Catholic brothers and sisters, obviously, but th in a sense we may have a better shot at going back to them than good Protestants do, because we <laughs> have <laughs> so along with them now that we can kind of interpret them so much, and in a sense the effect of history that this, these interpretations have on you there, there, we can skip that. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the more serious, I want to say something in response to serious concern about catechetics and, and teachers. Uh, it highlights for me, it's a very small point, the imperative of caring for the curricula that we put in the hands of our teachers. Because when you have volunteer teachers, uh, a good curriculum can make a world of difference. And that one of the and so there's the possibilities there of strategically locating good curricula in the hands of other the volunteer catechists or, or indeed our religious educators in our Catholic grade schools and high schools equally need that this kind of sensitivity in the curricula that we put in, our, in their hands. And I think one of the one of the so that's my positive point. I suppose one of the things I'm concerned about is that uh, the, the supervision of the curricula at this point is so concerned, especially with the committee on the catechism, about Catholic orthodoxy that we could miss out on this kind of imperative sensitivity that we all should have now, you know, almost, almost you know, 45 years after, after Nostra Aetate, that, this, that we root out the teaching of contempt and the teaching of supersessionism from the curricula that we put in the hands of our teachers. And I think, I, I would just add that I think that good work has been done in terms of the textbooks themselves uh, compared you. to where, uh, yes. I've written a couple. Yes, <laughs> yes, and I have too. So yes, I think we've done, we've tried to do the job. But it's not, it, it's, um, the, the, the textbooks have been cleaned up, but that's still not an integration of, uh, of this, you know, the way we perceive things. We, we, we're not saying the things that we used to say. We're not depicting the Pharisees as enemies of Jesus, but we're not helping to integrate this new awareness, uh, which is an important piece of what needs to be done. So I think um, I, I agree with you. Yes, it is a catechetical challenge for sure. Well, remember though that the thinking is evolving too. The magisterium is evolving, don't you think? I mean, that's a big piece of this. We're not just talking about the interpretation of scripture here, but how that affects the way in which we theologize. So we can speak of Jesus fulfilling the prophet Isaiah when he does this and says this, but what does it mean when we speak of the covenant being fulfilled in Jesus Christ? Something like that. Mm -hmm. That's a whole, this is where the, 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 the where John Clabeau's point, I think, 
of the, of the scripture scholar speaking to the systematic theologians and that kind of work. And, and, and so often for people, it's not really at the level of the, the, the scriptural question. It's at the, the, the level of the assumption uh, you know, w w that, that, that the fulfillment of the covenant in Jesus Christ means that the covenant with the Jews has simply been abrogated and obliterated. And that's a, and, and frankly, we, we see this in, you know, some official statements that occasionally get made, exactly. so, or at least uh, essays that are written and so forth by people who ought to know a little bit better than that. So yeah, it's a big problem. Mm -hmm. Before I got on the plane uh, today, my Roman Catholic scholar put the following piece of paper in my um, hand. I did. Um, th this is um, in response a bishop of Grosseto, um, Bishop Babini. Um, responded to the Pope's visit to the synagogue saying, I think the Pope did well to visit it. But with the same frankness, the moment has arrived to state that the Jews are no longer our elder brothers, or to say it better, they were our elder brothers until the arrival of Christ, and then they abandoned him and did not recognize him. Again, I, th I hope you can hear the motifs or some of the themes off of Luke 4. They are against history, and from the New Testament onward have chosen not to be our brothers. A different shoot has been grafted onto the olive tree. The church was born from Christ and not from the Jews. Now, that kind of statement um, from the retired bishop suggests that the amount of labor and work that needs to be done um, to, to learn to read scriptures more faithfully is an imperative of the utmost urgency. Please. Well, I, I just wanted to add that um, there's a lot of, I, I, I would um, it be in agreement with what was said about what we might call the midrash of the text, namely how it fits into the tradition or what the average person in the pews thinks about things. And when um, Celia and I at one workshop <coughs> had somebody say to Celia, well, uh, I know I'm not supposed to say this, um, that, that um, the Jews killed Jesus, but they did, didn't they? <laughs> so there's, you need, you need to go beyond the text, and you need to address some of the ways in which this text is brought into the community um, at the grassroots. Thank you. Please. You're here with one collar, but two hats. One hat is your pastoral hat, and the other is the hat that you wear in your position at the Archdiocese. I'm going to assume that you're familiar with the two books that Celia has written for elementary school Catholic kids. My Muslim friend. Yes, she, didn't she, didn't Muslim. she didn't write the Muslim friend. She wrote the Jewish other. friend. Yeah. But it exists. Right. Maybe mm -hmm. not ideally the way you or Celia or Naomi would want it, but it exists. And maybe it could be rewritten so it's up to O'Connor and we'll see if this book, My Jewish Friend. But I'd like you to respond as to whether you would think that that should be in the same way that what Celia and Naomi are doing, just very quickly, is now a part of the Master of Arts and Ministry program. Should that book, My Jewish Friend, and other books like it, dealing with other cultures and mm -hmm. religions, be in your elementary school? Sure. So each kid gets it, sure. and all of the 150,000 Roman Catholic kids. So that 30 to 40 years. You got the budget for that, Harvey? <laughs> I got it all figured out. I'll talk to you. No, but I gave it to my own director of religious education. In fact, a couple of copies of it for our own religious education of program. Is not what I'm about. You don't hand out a couple of copies of the New Testament. You make sure everybody has yeah. My question was. was, uh, you mentioned the formation of everybody except the clergy. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're the only ones in our Catholic Church who can preach. 
That's right. We have many teachers, but they're the preachers. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing to follow them? Well, actually, CIA does do some formation of clergy, namely our deacons. I'm not in formation. Yeah. I'm not in formation of, 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 of men for priesthood. Um, I, I know that the information that they get here at the seminary is very good information. They have very, very fine scripture professors here. I certainly did. Uh, but I think there's a difference between information that's imparted to you, good information, correct information, and then your ability when you're in ministry to be able to integrate that into the whole life and ministry. So that's an ongoing process. So in many ways, that's, that's I work that does fall into the aegis of my office, namely the ongoing formation of priests and trying to get this information to priests. So formation, I think, in terms of preaching, isn't just what takes place in those first few years at the seminary. You can only give so much information in those first few years. It's what happens in the years after that and the way in which we nurture good preaching based on growing insight into what the, the preaching task is, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's there I think we could probably do a lot better than, than we are doing, but certainly I have taken very seriously in my role uh, the need to get good information out to our priests and you know, a modest attempt has been with our website and also with mailings that we've done over the years to our priests, especially at around the time of Lent, Good Friday, that's where we uh, mailed out you know, uh, over the course of several years thousands of copies of, of that literature. So it's, a, it's, it's not just restricted to seminary years. Yes, uh, Phil Cunningham is, is a, yeah. a real pioneer in a lot of these issues and is always a, a good combination of the um, scholarly and the practical. Anything he does in this field, I think, is excellent. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question here at Michael. Um, I just through an experience at Brandeis, is probably unique to have that sort of exposure. Um, I would say that the Catholic Church has so many different sources for developing an understanding of the Jewish person. And I'm curious, are we perhaps overestimating the force of scripture in shaping the perception? Yes and no. How's that for coming down firmly on the fence? <laughs> it's very Jewish. With some <laughs> yes and no. Um, I think, Jim, that we've moved beyond issues like collective culpability for the death of Jesus. Um, I'm talking about in ministry here, right? Um, we move beyond some of this. There's a sense out there that, I, I mean, I, I think most Catholics today, maybe I'm overestimating this, I don't know, believe that the Jew, all the Jews are not responsible for the death of Jesus. I think that's been undone. That's what I talked about, this dismantling of the teaching of contempt. I, I think the bigger, so, I would say that, however, our scriptures are fairly decisive in terms of forming how people understand Jews and Judaism, because first of all, we tend to see Jews as the people who are in our scriptures, and not we don't have the opportunity to encounter them in the living reality. That's why I advocate um, working in interreligious uh, clergy associations and this kind of thing, visiting local synagogues, and building relations, in other words, at the local level. I think the bigger problem in terms of the way folks think is the, um, the sort of soft supersessionism, um, the, the sort of default position that's there and the way we think that, um, uh, that if our covenant is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, if the covenant is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, that somehow or other Judaism has become uh, essentially an empty reality. I think that's more the problem. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I'm saying this very well. Um, but what about the Christian students at Brandeis? What was their experience of having gone to a Brandeis education with this oh, I see. exposure? Well, I hope it was much better because of what I tried to do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I certainly uh, took that, uh, you know, as my responsibility there as a preacher uh, very, very seriously and tried, uh, and of course there's an ongoing engagement with the Jewish reality outside of the campus. So I think many of the 
the students came uh, away from the Brandeis education with a much richer sense of not only of Judaism, certainly, as a living reality, and very confusing reality, I think, for Catholics. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the richness of diversity in Jewish thinking and practice is always, I think, something that's a real eye-opener for, for, for Christians. And that's one of the first sort of um, distortions or prejudices they have that overcome, that there's no such thing, meaningfully speaking, as the Jews when it comes to practice and belief and so forth. So they have to get beyond that. Uh, but I think in terms of their own understanding of their Catholic faith in light of what was taking place in the chapel at Brandeis on a regular basis in terms of what I was trying to do in preaching and bringing scripture scholarship to them and creating programs for them and so forth, I hope it was a much richer uh, experience. I, I, I'm, I'm sure it was. And, and I'm, I also would be willing to wager that the most powerful transformative um, dynamic is the formation of friendships with Jews. And it, if you can go through Brandeis without um, becoming friends with, with um, a Jewish colleague, I mean, I, there's gotta be something wrong with you. <laughs> um, so it strikes me that what, what occurs when the intimacy of encountering a Jew who actually is literate um, in his or her tradition is that the stereotypes um, that are loaded onto us from the culture at large um, are contested, and they're very difficult to sustain. One of my uh, sort of early experiences of Judaism was when I first went to Israel, I was part of a study program to learn modern Hebrew in the summer of 1966, and the first night I was there, uh, 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 one of the other people on the program who had a, a sort of Hasidic background but was himself now a a professor type said, do you want to come to uh, a Hasidic service? He knew all of these people and how to get there and all the rest of it. So I said, sure. Here's this Irish Catholic kid from Boston all of a sudden in this mm. Hasidic group. And they're speaking Yiddish, basically, with a sprinkling of Hebrew, which I could get some of. And then they did this uh, dance outside, a kind of rondo uh, uh, under the moon type of thing. and. Uh, I think uh, the having an experience of Jewish people at prayer is important Absolutely. because you know when I heard these people talking about the scriptures and I, I saw them at prayer, I said I, I can relate to that. And in fact, when when I first began my uh, program at Harvard in ancient Near Eastern languages, my advisor was Isidore Tversky, who was the professor of Jewish studies at the time, a very uh, 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 extraordinary figure, I I able to be both a, uh, a very significant academic and a person who was devoted to his uh, religious tradition at the same time. And I said, I want to learn about Judaism and particularly about rabbinic Judaism. And he said, okay, let's start with Jewish prayer. And so we did a reading course on Jewish prayer. Mm -hmm. And it, in a sense, changed my life because I, again, I saw a lot of analogs between Jewish prayer and Christian prayer, but also it sort of got me inside the soul of the Jewish people to uh, the extent that I ever could, uh, and could uh, appreciate the commonality between the two. I think uh, having an experience uh, of Jewish piety is important. Uh, too often, I think our theological students, and I'm as responsible for that as anybody, uh, think of Jews follow the Old Testament, we follow the New Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it, it's not that simple. And, and I think by seeing Judaism as a, a living, vibrant religion, that I think is a, a very important experience for seminarians and for uh, students of theology as a whole. Yeah. Audrey, you want to? I'd like to come back for a moment to the conversation So I, I come back to seminary formation. I 
I'm sure when you're talking about the good teaching that's going on, that it would be happening in scripture, theology. And I think back to in the earlier years when the American bishops were working really hard to bring the teachings of Nostra Aetate, et cetera, into the dioceses, into the parishes, and so on. And Eugene Fisher, who was going to be with us here today, wrote a textbook, actually, which was to uh, be a, a way of informing seminary curricula in order to bring these teachings not only to scripture and theology, there, yes, but also into the various aspects of the explicit and implicit curriculum. And I'm just wondering, I guess I just raised that as an observation, mm -hmm. and I don't know if anybody would have any uh, remark on that. But I think we can, we can provide very good scriptural teaching, provide very good theology, and that is important. I don't mm -hmm. want to underestimate that. But I'm wondering to what extent, like some of the things that have been talked about, it's, it's more than that. We've been talking about integration, et cetera, et cetera, how that is being helped in the seminary, to bring, to bring that into the seminary as well. Well, I can't speak authoritatively about the seminary since I'm not really directly involved in formation. I will observe, of course, that the rector is Father Arthur Kennedy who was the uh, uh, executive director of the bishop's office for ecumenical interreligious affairs. So certainly art would bring a very lively sense of the national and international ecumenical interreligious scene. <clears throat> I think that's probably going to be very important in the life of that community as it, as it develops. And I would say this, I'm, I'm going to guess that any seminary is a mirror of the bigger church. So all of the challenges and tensions and successes and setbacks that you see in the wider church, you're probably going to see reflected in some way in the thinking uh, and the, 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 the tr transmission of information, teaching, and so forth there in the seminary. So I don't think that uh, that should really come as a surprise to us. I do think what's, what's key in, in the life of dioceses is, is the diocesan work in terms of relations ecumenically and interreligiously. And um, I can say here uh, that we have worked mightily to, despite the fact that Ed O'Flaherty, who's here, is director of the office and also responsible for uh, life within the Jesuit community here. Dr. Vito Nicastro, who's with us, uh, is only part-time, uh, and, and I'm a pastor. Uh, but I do think it's critically important that we have that kind of witness that, and, and that we are reaching out, as you know very well, we do, to local, by the way, my portfolio also encompasses our relationship with the Muslim community, interreligious relations, so there's a whole other set of complex issues there. Um, and, uh, and here in the Archdiocese, we work ecumenically, not only in our ecumenical agenda, but also in terms of our interreligious relations. We work very, very closely with the Massachusetts Council of Churches. Uh, so in terms of leadership contact and leadership exchange and so forth, we work very, very, very hard. Um, I'd like to say I think we work very well. I'm sure there, there are, there's even more that we could do. But given our limitations, I think we do a pretty good job at the level of leadership. I'll also say, again, and I'm speaking anecdotally, I don't think any kind of study's been done, that I've noticed over the years that as the priests, and not just the priests, but uh, the, the, the priests of the archdiocese, when they come up against an issue that is for them a pastoral concern with the relationship with Jews or something of that nature, or one who gave me a call the day after Easter because he had read the Easter readings and there was a Jewish person who was a friend of one of the family members there and had raised the issue, et cetera, they give me a call and they want to be able to talk about it and understand it better. So there's an awareness there. So I think these are ways that, um, at least here locally, that we try to, um, to deal with, with these issues. What, can, can I quickly respond to that? When I talk to my, um, colleague, my Roman Catholic colleagues at St. Mary's Seminary and some other spots, what I hear is um, a lament to the effect that there's so much remedial work that's being done simply to bring um, incoming seminarians up to speed and there's such a desire on the part of um, the, the, the priests in formation to, to, 
to master the material that will allow them to get down to being a priest, that the issues of um, anti-Judaism in the New Testament, you know, whether it's real or illusory, um, it, get, it gets pushed off to the back burner. And it's unrealistic from the vantage point of those seminary professors to think that one can adequately integrate this agenda into the curriculum. There's just too much that needs to be done. So the hope is that when seminarians graduate, they will have the good sense to become friends with the local rabbi and find opportunities for ongoing study. What, what we see in Baltimore um, is that the, the, the vast majority of priests have these huge congregations and they are pulled in so many different directions that they, having the opportunity to feed their intellectual and spiritual life um, through this kind of interfaith text study gets kind of shoved aside. So the irony from my vantage point, painful irony, is that the most important ecclesiastical changes that have taken place have been within the Roman Catholic Church. You guys are leading the charge in terms of really um, um, re-envisioning a relationship between Christians and Jews. But in terms of learning and mastering and have it becoming a praxis, a regular praxis within the, um, those priests, um, a lot of them, um, we, we have great luck engaging luck. We, we are providentially blessed <laughs> to have um, Roman Catholic educators and scholars and, and um, community leaders abundantly represented. We have a heck of a time getting priests to the table. Thanks. So do we. Last week, the Boston Symphony Orchestra gave the American premiere of a newly composed St. John Passion. And it was uh, thrilling in a number of ways. It was thrilling musically. It was uh, uh, thrilling in uh, things that the composer did. He, he took the words of the gospel St. John, and as Bach did in his time, he added some things on. And what he added were some gospel texts and then some later texts from the uh, medieval tradition, shall we call it. Uh, so for example, after Jesus says, shall I not drink the cup which has been given to me, he quotes the words, the, the composer brings in the words of the, uh, what we call the institution narrative from the Last Supper with the cup of his blood. Uh, later, after Peter's denial, he brings in, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I shall build my church. Wow, something to really uh, think about here. Same guy. Um, the whole thing is in ten parts. In the eighth part, he assigns to the soloist, who uh, otherwise just sings the words of Jesus, he assigns to this soloist the reproaches from Good Friday. My people, what have you done to me? I led you out of Egypt, and this is what you're doing, and has the chorus sing the response, Holy God, Mighty God, Lord have mercy. And, well, it, the, the composer is a 50-year-old Catholic who for years has, we are told, participated in the chanting of the gospel on Good Friday in his parish. So he's, he's a, a devout Catholic. He is doing a, uh, a, an astonishing work of uh, putting things together, of collecting things from the, uh, from the Catholic tradition. And he puts this forward, which at best, at best needs considerable theological explanation uh, to, uh, to make it fit for people to, uh, to hear 
wider church and in the context of the tradition. Yeah, uh, exactly. And in, in, in the sense that that's where we began, the, the, the sort of, uh, even though uh, we've made great progress in a sense, uh, the popular culture seems to go oftentimes in another direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're getting uh, close to our time, so I would like to uh, thank you especially for being here. We've been here for two and a half hours. We've uh, aired a lot of very interesting ideas. The richness of our, um, our discussion has been quite uh, striking to me personally. I want to thank also my colleagues for their uh, taking seriously my book, but also for placing the issue in a much wider pastoral, ecumenical, and educational context. So I thank you all, and I thank you for this wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would also like to add a few words um, on behalf of the center to thank you, Dan, again for your works, but also for your wonderful present, uh, presentation and presence here this afternoon, and to our three panelists. I'm not even going to try to say what makes me think you deserve gratitude. I was at the back of the room much of the time, and even though some people had to arrive late and some had to leave early, the attention was remarkable. And that speaks volumes for the quality of the presentations and the quality of the conversation. I want to mention again that uh, there's going to be a reception outside if you can stay around and mingle and continue the conversations. Those of you who came late uh, did not hear me say at the beginning that we unfortunately ran out of the autographed copies of Dan's book, which we promised to everyone who came. If you did not receive one and would like to, there are two sheets out on the registration table. Leave us your name, telephone number, and email address. We're going to be putting in another order, and we'll make sure that you get your copy. So thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Thank you. 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 Thank you for the work that you're doing down there, too. You know,